That was the best introduction I have ever had. How are you all today? Greetings, people of Earth. How do you do? Looking all wonderful and inventive today. I'm going to fire this up really quick, and we are going to get started. I have a lot to share. Uh, and like any responsible person in the science fields, I'm going to start with a huge caveat. Um, there's a lot of uh, biology uh, that I will be talking about. And for the sake of conversation, for the sake of this presentation, uh, a lot of it is translated into, uh, I think, more digestible uh, expressions of the idea. So uh, I don't want anybody you know, coming up to me and pushing up their glasses and telling me about certain biological facts at the end of this. Uh, a lot of this is for the sake of conversation. Here we go. Here's what we're here to talk about, okay? Ladies and gentlemen, and, and, and folks, and they and them, I want to be inclusive of everybody, because that sounds like a good panel. Um, so we're going to talk about collaborative communities and the power of diverse niches. Uh, that is a word I've had to practice several times, even uh, previously on stage. Uh, so as David said, I'm an astrobiofuturist. And essentially what that means is that I get to uh, have a lot of fun exploring the intersection between what space exploration uh, this concept of biomimicry or turning to nature for solutions and uh, speculative design um, where they intersect for the sake of creating better futures. So uh, this is uh, essentially a very niche space. Um, it allows me to uh, help people challenge their core assumptions about the futures that they're looking to create and in doing them help them discover new things that they weren't uh, expecting or even originally thinking were possible. Uh, and as David mentioned, this is due to the fact that I am a huge nerd from the 90s. Uh, and so each of these characters that you see were individuals that I found uh, different parts of the person that I aspire to be hidden within. Uh, and also, a lot of this work has to do with uh, the, the experiences that I've had working for Walt Disney Imagineering, uh, imagining the future of uh, different worlds, creating different worlds, using narrative as a tool to align thinking uh, and to, again, challenge thoughts about what is possible for the future. Um, but really, for me, the core of what I do now is rooted in an event that took place in 2006. Uh, many of you all will remember uh, the natural and man-made disaster that was Hurricane Katrina and its impact on the Gulf Coast. So at the time, I was a Howard uh, architecture student. And when we saw everything that was happening on the news, myself and 500 other students, uh, like many students around the country uh, and the world, uh, just decided to get on a bus and drive down to the Gulf Coast to do whatever we could, just volunteer in whatever way possible. And seeing everything you know, after the waters had receded, um, firsthand, seeing that level of, of destruction and devastation, it left a, a, an indelible impression on me. And it left me with a lot of questions. Uh, questions like, you know, why does this tend to mostly impact um, communities of color? Why does it mostly tend to impact um, communities that are uh, lower income? And why does it tend to impact lower income communities of color? Um, and so in trying to find answers to these questions, and applying those questions to even my student work at the time, I came across this quote from Albert Einstein that says, look deep into nature, and then you'll understand everything better. And that is essentially what I do at the core, 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 core of, of this work. Um, uh, it is uh, amazing what happens when you ask this question and when you turn to nature for answers. It has led me on uh, many interesting journeys around the world and it has allowed me to interact with a lot of uh, really amazing, phenomenal creatures. And uh, most recently, it allowed me to take an Apple Vision Pro to the Galapagos Islands uh, and uh, walk amongst giant tortoises uh, to explore what this new mixed reality technology might have to offer uh, the future of storytelling, particularly related to wildlife and conservation. Um, so, a lot of this is really rooted in the fact that I get to ask a lot of really great questions. 
One question um, that I was recently asked when the pandemic initially hit by an organization was, how does nature build and maintain adaptive communities? And being able to ask these questions leads you to a lot of really amazing answers in the natural world uh, and a really a lot of <laughs> unique discoveries, like the fact that bees twerk for democracy. Uh, now, you know, I know we are relatively close to the Bible Belt, so if dancing for democracy uh, fits your appetite better, that, that's another way that we can say that as well. Um, but what I mean by that is if you look at this bee, uh, you will notice that it is performing what's actually called a waggle dance. And this waggle dance is actually a set of coordinates that it is relaying to the bees around it uh, that leads to uh, a location where this bee believes is a great place for them to expand their hive community. So what will happen is the rest of those bees will fly out to those coordinates, and if they agree that this is a great place this is prime real estate for us to expand, they will come back and perform the same, uh, the same dance. And once there is a majority of bees conducting this dance, when they are all twerking on the wall together, then um, a decision has been made and that is where they will move to expand their, their hive and their community. Um, another really great uh, discovery and exploration in trying to answer that question around maintaining and building adaptive communities uh, was being able to discover what's called the flock dynamics behind common starlings. And what's amazing about this aerial choreography is that all of these birds, what they're really doing is just following a, a set of very simple rules. And mostly it boils down to each bird maintaining a certain proximity to the birds on each side and the bird in front. So as one bird moves, the other birds will shift to maintain that proximity. And because of that, they're able to not only not collide, but they're also able to um, have this very dynamic movement as a unit by following these very, very simple rules. So my goal, my hope for today is to serve as Morpheus, right? I came with the bald head, I got some glasses, right? Um, but to hopefully help you all see the natural world in a different light, and, and by doing so, help you see some answers that you may not have uh, previously realized may be right in front of you or just outside your window. So with that in mind, let's jump into talking about collaborative communities. There are three things uh, that uh, I'm going to focus on covering in this conversation that we are about to have. Um, and I want you to say these words with me. Ecosystem. Niche is is, just kidding, I was, <laughs> I'm still on the California time, so if you can't tell, um, and mutualisms. Perfect, okay, so let's talk about ecosystems. The, uh, before we jump into that, anytime you see this slide, I want you to raise your hand and say it out loud, ecosystems are everywhere. Okay, try it again so we can get that bird cohesion. <laughs> Ecosystems are everywhere. Perfect, perfect. Okay, so this is uh, a broadly accepted um, definition of what an ecosystem is. Essentially, it is where all living things in a given area interact with each other and the world around them. Uh, a more refined answer to this question that's not as biological uh, is that ecosystems are complex networks of interconnected uh, systems. Uh, and I, I feel like this is one very appropriate for uh, human organizations, um, while also maintaining the, the really the essence of what an ecosystem is in the biological world. So, before we go any further, I need everybody to take out their phone. Everyone's gonna take a selfie. You're gonna remember, I guarantee you're gonna remember this selfie that you're about to take. One, because I'll explain it at the end, and two, uh, you're gonna take a selfie as close to your forehead as possible, okay? I wanna see the phones out. As close, to get all up in the grill of your forehead, okay? And then when you're done, well, I'll just, I'll just see the phones go down. Let's see. Just get, get all up in there. Just fill the whole screen with what you got. However much of, if you got a five head, 
get it in there, okay? All right, I'm seeing, I'm seeing things go down. Okay, are we good? Are we good? Everybody got, everybody got the forehead selfie? Okay, perfect. All right, we're gonna come back to this. We're gonna come back to this. We got a lot of ground to cover. Okay, so there are certain characteristics that help each ecosystem become unique. And uh, a lot of these are non-living factors. Uh, the, 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 the rocks, the geology, the typography, the humidity, and the temperature of a certain location. All of these things help to define what makes an ecosystem unique. There's also these living factors, such as you know, the, the way that humans interact with an environment, um, the, the bacteria, the fungi, uh, the animals and plants. All of these things are part of what will sculpt and craft what an ecosystem becomes. And when these two things, uh, when these two types of factors collide, they lead to, again, this sense of a interconnected um, relationship that helps to define and diversify the types of ecosystems that we see around the world. So in addition to this, there are these things called operating conditions. And everything, everything on this planet uh, lives and has to deal with these operating conditions. So everything that's alive, everything that's non-living, has to in some way um, endure or uh, become resilient to these operating conditions. So what are the operating conditions of Earth? Well, they are things such as sunlight, gravity, and water. Uh, they are ebbs and flows in, in resources. There are obstacles and limitations. There's cycles and seasonality. And then there is this idea um, that is called non-dynamic, non dynamic non-equilibrium, right? Which is this idea that things constantly change. So everything on this planet has to deal with these. And for me as a person who practices biomimicry, this is where I see the opportunity for us to translate a lot of the solutions that exist in nature into solutions at the human scale. And so uh, with, with these things, uh, we have identified certain characteristics that are indicators of a healthy ecosystem. And uh, this one is a big one for me, this idea that nature optimizes rather than it maximizes. And so what does that mean? Essentially, rather than using all of a resource until it is no longer available, uh, what tends to happen in the natural world is um, organisms will optimize, they will use the, the amount that allows them to be sustained in the moment and allows that resource to continue on rather than simply trying to use it all in one go. Um, another important factor is the fact that uh, nature only uses the energy that it needs, very similar to this idea of optimization. Nothing is wasted in the natural world. Everything is recycled because everything that, is, that we might perceive as a waste is an opportunity in the natural world. And that's a very key thing as well, and another key indicator. And then there's also this idea that I'm gonna talk a little bit more, this idea that um, nature actually rewards cooperation. This is a, a big underrated uh, indicator. And then also nature thrives on diversity. So when I'm talking about diversity in the natural world, we refer to that as biodiversity. And again, um, I want to emphasize that this is a very smart crowd. So I'm hoping that this is more of a refresher and a primer for some folks. Um, rather than something that you might be hearing new. And if it is new, great. I'm glad to be the person to, to present this to you. Uh, and so this idea of biodiversity also is related to niches because the more niches that you have in an ecosystem, the more dynamic and the more resilient that ecosystem is. So you want this sense of diversity and you want these different unique qualities within your ecosystem because it is another indicator that you are on the right track. So pop quiz number one. Yeah, damn right they are. Um, <laughs> okay, so moving from ecosystems into niches, uh, the definition of a niche is essentially the role that an organism plays in an environment, uh, in an ecosystem rather. And uh, this includes what the organism consumes or produces, the way that it interacts with others in the ecosystem, 
and also where it lives within the ecosystem. Uh, not necessarily from a hierarchical standpoint, but what is it, again, con contributing and putting in and taking out of the ecosystem and how is it helping to maintain the overall cohesion of that unit? And a big part of how niches are developed are through what we refer to as biological functions. So uh, a biological function is essentially the goal or the objective that um, an organism through some adaptation is trying to solve. So for example, we have a spider web on the left, and then we have a fishing net on the right. What would you say is the common objective that both of those things are trying to solve for? Boom, perfect, to capture, right? So the way that a spider goes about capturing prey is uh, most often through, uh, through the design of, of this web, right? And so that function of to capture becomes uh, part of the niche way that, uh, that these spiders exist. And so again, the, the, the function is essentially the objective or the goal. Uh, and in addition to that, the strategy is also where you have some niche development. So you have your initial goal and objective, and then there's how you go about trying to solve for that objective that helps to create that sense of uniqueness and that unique role that you play within an ecosystem. So uh, to give you a, a, a better example of this, here we have three birds that all exist within the same ecosystem, but their niches are all very different. So uh, I'll talk about the jacana bird in a moment. Uh, the heron is more of a larger bird. It has the ability to just kind of sit and wait for prey and then go underneath the water and capture them. Uh, the spoonbill has much of a, a, and you can also see in the, the formation of their beaks um, that some of these niches play out you know, morphologically in, their shape in the shape language of their bodies. Uh, the spoonbill, with its larger beak, goes after a different set of prey, um, uh, frogs and things like that. And then the jacana bird is really unique because it has developed uh, a very interesting niche in how it goes about prey within the same ecosystem. So uh, if you zoom in closely, you'll, need, you'll see these, uh, I was about to, about to cuss, uh, these very interesting, nasty uh, looking toes. Uh, <laughs> you can fill in the blanks. Um, but these, these very interesting toes uh, that actually allow it to evenly distribute the weight of its body um, across the surface of water. And so because of that, the jacana bird is actually able to walk across water. Um, again, Bible Belt reference, you know, they, they often refer to this as the Jesus Christ, um, uh, uh, the Jesus Christ bird. Uh, and the reason why they say that is because what this, what this bird does is it walks along the surface of water, usually on top of lily pads, uh, and it will go and find prey that are hiding amongst the flowers uh, that exist on top of these lily pads. And so it doesn't have to compete against a hornbill or a spoonbill. It has found its own unique niche and has over time developed the ability to successfully find its prey within the same ecosystem. So, pop quiz number two. What is the function that these two organisms share? I'm so glad everyone ate breakfast already. Just, just shout it out. Kill prey, I hear. Camouflage, excellent, excellent. So, uh, what is the strategy that each of these two organisms are using? Okay, so that's, that's, that's still part of the function, but that's along the, the right thinking, right? So they are, they are both camouflaging or concealing themselves. How, how is their strategy different? That is fantastic. 10 points to this person here. Um, for those of you who don't know, uh, the tigers hold a, a, a special niche, not only as apex predators, uh, but also as keystone species. Uh, they help to balance out the populations of, of, 
other forms of wildlife that they typically prey on. And the way that they're able to occupy this niche is because uh, the prey that tigers um, primarily feast upon are monochromatic. We as humans, as many of you know, are dichromatic. So we can see the color orange. But deer and rabbit and most of the things that tigers hunt cannot see the color orange. So it has the perfect uh, camouflage for it to be able to sneak up and hunt on their prey. Uh, fun fact, I thought that was awesome. So I wanted to, whether or not it was related to ecosystems, I was gonna have this slide in here because I just thought it was awesome. So, <laughs> and there's a lot of, there's obviously a lot of benefits uh, to having a niche. Um, so you, you become more adaptive and resilient to, to changes. Um, the, the beauty of having a niche is that you, are, you actually become more efficient in your resources. Again, you're not, you're not competing with other organisms. You're finding other ways to leverage what works for you to your benefit. And in so doing, you also are more innovative. And so there are three rules that I have for finding your niche. Rule number one, identify your core function and strategy, okay? Remember that the function is the goal or the objective that you're after. The strategy is how you go about accomplishing that goal. Uh, and that leads me to rule number two, which is uh, to practice this concept of ikigai. Has anybody, anybody, perfect. Okay, so I'm not gonna explain it because five people here know about it. So you can go see them, no, I'm just kidding, just kidding. Pronounced ikigai. Uh, this Japanese concept, uh, iki, um, translates to, uh, sorry, you know what's funny? I clicked that on accident. Um, iki referring to, to uh, life, and the, the guy is referring to this idea of something that's coming to fruition. So the idea being that uh, your living, the, the purpose of your living is coming to to being, and you, you have an understanding and an awareness of that. And so uh, yesterday, as Jonathan was talking about love being a part of what we do, I was so happy because uh, the way that these four quadrants that you see here come together is combining what you love, what you are good at, what someone is willing to pay for, um, and uh, what, uh, what, the, what the world needs and finding the central overlap between those things, uh, between your passion, your vocation, uh, your mission, and um, your profession. So this is more of a human-oriented way of looking at finding your niche, but uh, it's been very effective, uh, and so I thought it was worth sharing with you all as a, another translation of how we go about finding that niche. And then rule number three, whatever you do, do not diminish your role and your contribution to the ecosystem, okay? Some of the most uh, smallest, seemingly insignificant, and literally invisible organisms play some of the biggest roles in the health and maintenance of ecosystems. And I'll give you an example uh, in a little bit. Uh, another thing I want to point out that's not a rule, but just words to remember, words to live by. Um, how many of you all have seen this or heard this or had someone tell you this. <laughs> I'm surprised not everyone's hands went up. Okay. So this idea of survival of the fittest um, is a biological concept, but it is grossly mis, uh, misconstrued. And instead of only the strongest survive, what is really meant is that only the best suited to their environment, right? The ones who have found the I uh, ideal niche within an environment are able to survive within that environment. That is the, the, the true translation of what this phrase is supposed to mean. So next time somebody comes at you, okay, <laughs> with some attitude talking about survival of the fittest, you say, no, sir, because <laughs> most likely it's gonna be a man, right? Let's, just, let's be honest about it. Um, or, you know, I mean, equal opportunity, you know, uh, uh, I'm gonna keep going, uh, so don't get myself in trouble. Uh, so rule number 3.5, build relationships within your ecosystem. And that leads me from concluding our section on niches uh, 
into talking about uh, mutualisms. So there are many different types of relationships that exist within ecosystems. There's symbiotic relationships, there are parasitic relationships, nobody wants that, right? Um, and then there's some relationships where no one, no one gains and no one benefits. The one that I thought was most appropriate uh, for this inventive crowd was uh, mutualisms. And mutualisms really speak to this idea that collaboration happens more often than people think in the natural world. I would dare say, and I think a lot of scientists would agree, that you probably see more collaboration in nature than you actually see competition. And so to give you a couple of fun examples from this uh, recent trip uh, that I, I was blessed to have to uh, go to the Galapagos Islands, um, there's this interesting partnership that takes place amongst many of the organisms that live within the Galapagos. And part of that is because while they are islands, their unique geography, topo topography, uh, and other characteristics of that environment and ecosystem actually puts a um, uh, pressure on what kind of resources can survive and thrive there. So there's actually not a lot of um, insect diversity amongst the islands. And because of that, there's not a lot of uh, organisms that can really live and thrive there without that base, um, again, small but mighty um, significant role that an insect plays within any ecosystem. In the Galapagos, there's not a lot of those. So organisms have to find other ways to combine, uh, to collect the resources that they need to survive. And that's why on the islands you see a lot of, uh, a lot of cooperative relationships. So on the left, you're seeing a Sally Lightfoot crab, and on the right, you see the only iguana that swims in the world, known as a marine iguana. And what's, what's really cool is just, just to nerd out for two seconds, um, marine iguanas, they actually dive under the water, and they feast on algae that grows amongst the rocks below the, the water surface. So right now, this is low tide, which is why those uh, iguanas are there. So they will collect these resources by going into the water. And then when they come back on the surface to essentially dry out and warm up, uh, these crabs will come over to them and crawl over them and start picking at their skin, right? Uh, and it's actually a mutualistic relationship because what the crab is actually doing is it's eating the, the skin cells, the dead skin cells um, from the from the crab, I'm sorry, from the iguana. That's interesting. <laughs> Don't know why I did that, okay. Um, uh, so the crab will eat the dead skin cells off of the iguana. So the iguana gets a spa day, right? And uh, the crab gets something to eat. And this is one of those really unique ways that nature finds a way to partner and is another example of how nothing in the natural world is wasted. Uh, both have found some opportunity to get something that they need uh, from each other in a way that, again, neither is harmed and both benefit. Uh, and so even in some of the most extreme places in, um, in the world, these collaborations are taking place. So at the bottom of the ocean, near hydrothermal, vent, near hydrothermal vents, there is uh, what you're seeing what you're seeing is a tube worm, and what you're not seeing is the bacteria that, are, that is in partnership uh, with this tube worm, where the tube worm uh, essentially is able to take some of the chemicals that are being pumped out from underneath the Earth's surface and translate those into nutrients that the bacteria needs, and the bacteria uh, actually helps to digest the food that the tube worm doesn't have a stomach to digest. And so they are able to swap these resources in a way that allows both to survive, and not only survive, thrive, again, in one of the most extreme environments known to, known to humankind. And then there's, there's this example, which is fun to me. I mean, I'm a big believer in the power of ants. Small and amazing, a, 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 the ability to so many different things. I mean, they can, they can create a rafts out of their community to make sure that everyone survives by literally linking arms together. They will literally link arms together and 
by doing so, the, the hairs on an ant's legs and arms uh, are become hydrophobic. So because they've linked arms, that's how they're able to create a raft because they're literally together pushing away, um, pushing away water. And so that's, you know, if, if a flood happens, that's one way that they're able to survive. Um, but in this example, they're serving as muscle for the aphids, the little green things that you see here. So in this partnership, the, and if you look closely, you'll see it right there. So what's happening is the aphids produce this honeydew kind of nectar secretion that the ants go crazy for. I'm convinced it's, it's crack for ants, okay? It's <laughs> gonna be real, okay? I think so. They go crazy for it, okay? Um, and so in exchange, the ants treat them like their own. So if there are other insects that might be threats to um, uh, aphid larvae, they will pick up the aphids uh, and carry them and sometimes uh, nurture them within their own hive until, I'm, I'm sorry, within their own colony uh, until they establish a new location. Uh, and so the ants get this, you know, grape juice, nectar drink that they love, and uh, the, the aphids get protection from, from things that would bring them harm. Uh, and so just to circle back to the marine iguanas, um, if any of you have heard about Darwin's finches, uh, those are really great examples of niches where even within the same community, these collection of birds who have over time developed different types of beaks to go after different types of prey, I'm sorry, different types of, of food, um, in this particular relationship, this finch, um, whereas the, the, the Sally Lightfoot crab will exfoliate the skin of the, uh, of the marine iguanas, the finches will actually pick off any parasites that might have attached themselves to the marine iguanas while they're uh, diving in the water and swimming. So the finches will follow them around or uh, they'll just come up to them and just start picking at them. And these iguanas are so chill. They're just like, hey, thanks. And they, they peace out. That's, that's literally what happens. Um, and so one particular example that I wanted to share of mutualisms. <gasps> Do I have it? Yes. OK. This is a spoon. <laughs> OK? Uh, and within this spoon, in a healthy ecosystem, you can have billions of life forms that are existing within healthy soil. So within a teaspoon of healthy soil, there can exist up to, uh, uh, I think, uh, four billion uh, life forms have been counted or measured to exist within a healthy ecosystem that is no bigger than this tablespoon. Uh, and so all of these different organisms, again, play a role and create a community uh, within soil. So, you know, if you want good soil, this is, this is where the magic is, okay? Now, what's interesting about the, the soil food web is the fact that it is galactic. You know, I, myself and many other people refer to this as the cosmos at our feet. And within this web, there is a host of uh, biodiversity and what I'm gonna point out is just within one neighborhood, um, there exists a certain type of bacteria, certain types of bacteria that have a unique relationship with the plants that are, are grown within these ecosystems. And so at the, the root of plants, at every root of a plant, there is this thing called the rhizosphere, and it is this place of exchange. And so within the rhizosphere, uh, there, this mutualistic partnership exists where the bacteria sends out what's called, uh, has what's called auto-inducers. Auto and these are essentially chemical messages that it is able to uh, receive and transmit. And so what will happen is uh, the, the, the auto-inducers, the, the, the bacteria will receive some of these um, uh, receive some of these auto-inducers, these chemicals, and if, for example, the plant is in distress, uh, the, the plant itself can also communicate that through these chemical signals, 
and the auto inducer will respond to that by putting out its own um, response in the form of these chemical messages. And with there being other bacteria in the same environment, what happens is this idea called quorum sensing, where all of the bacteria will essentially start to collect, uh, collect these chemical messages, and when they all have uh, reached a quorum about the response, right, very similar to how the bees have this majority rule kind of um, uh, decision making, when there is a, a saturation of a certain type of autoinducer, the, the collective of bacteria will respond, and once they've responded and have reached a quorum on how they want to react, they can trigger a collective response. And in relation to the plants themselves, what scientists have discovered with certain plants is that these bacteria are able to highlight certain uh, gene expressions within the plant and can actually make the plant more resilient and responsive uh, to things such as uh, frost and drought. So you have this relationship that exists in this amazing cosmic world of soil where these unseen things are able to dynamically uh, alter a, a lot of the ecosystem around it by the partnership that they have, uh, where the plant, again, will provide the, provide the bacteria with resources, and in exchange, um, the, the bacteria can help the plant change, uh, essentially, in some ways. And so these are all examples of nurturing mut mutualisms, and they all resolve around networking, sharing resources, and creating partnerships. Uh, and so just to start to wrap it up, uh, there's a couple of questions that I think are helpful for you to ask yourselves as individuals and as a collective. So uh, the first question is, during times of crisis or chaos, what challenge do people or companies or organizations within your ecosystem come to you to solve? I'm just gonna let this one sit because this, this is a big and important question. And I'll tell you why this is important. Because during these times when all hell breaks loose or a pandemic happens, right, um, people tend to go into a mode of survival and essentialism. So if I am thinking about the essential person who can help me solve my problem, this is my go-to person for this thing, that is an identifier of what your niche is, okay? Uh, question number two, when resources are low, what type of laborious task could you maintain and enjoy, right? The enjoy part is actually a key part of that, right? Um, when, when things are tedious, when there's not a lot of resources, what are the things that you can still produce and, and, and thrive off of in a way, right? Um, question number three, relative to others in your field, what is unique about what you do and how you do it, right? So think back to function and strategy, right? Um, question number four, what skills, abilities, uh, or what skills or abilities could collaborators have that are complementary to supporting your mission, right? This idea that one person does everything or one organization does everything, there's something that you do really well, and then there's a whole bunch of other things that people are probably doing better that you might be able to offload, right, and further leverage your own energy and resources. And then question number five, how can your skills help others to achieve their goals. I'll, I'll leave this up for you all. Snap a photo, I'll, I'll send this out so that you all can, can have it. Okay, so we've asked the essential questions. Now there's two more. After you've answered these questions, and for yourself, for your organization, uh, and maybe even potentially identified some potential collaborators, here's two key questions that I think would be great for you to ask next. The first question is, how can I? How can I? How can I 
offload the things that I'm not necessarily good at? How can I find a way to collaborate with someone who does this thing I need done better than I can? Um, uh, how can I, how can I further leverage my skill set or the skill set of, of our team in a way that opens up more resources, right? And then what can happen when? And this question is really um, focused around the potential of those collaborations, right? So even if you don't have a particular collaborator identified, but maybe you have the skill sets that you know would be great for you, what can happen when I combine my skills with this skill set, right? What can happen when I partner with uh, someone who is completely different than me? Uh, and what can happen, again, what can happen when I offload X, Y, and Z to someone else, right? What does that free me up, or what does that free our organization up to do? <clears throat> okay. Ba boom Love it. Okay. Right now, everyone, take out that selfie. Say it with me, ecosystems are everywhere, including me. I am an ecosystem. I am full of ecosystems. <laughs> I am full of ecosystems. Okay, does everyone have that selfie out? You are, in fact, an ecosystem. You are an ecosystem of ecosystems. Does anybody know what this is? That's it. This is, this is a hair follicle. And right now, these precious little things are living the American dream or the, you know, international, uh, Europ European, African, you know, Turkish dream within the ecosystem that exists within that selfie. <laughs> Ecosystems are everywhere. Okay. <laughs> I told you you wouldn't look at it the same. <laughs> so, just to land the plane, Your niche, your diversity, the diversity of the niches within your, within your organization and within you is where your opportunity lies. So if ecosystems are everywhere, that means that opportunity is everywhere. You just have to continue to find those niches within whatever ecosystem you're, you're interacting with. We constantly move in and out of different ecosystems, right? And so within each ecosystem is new opportunity for us to develop a new niche or to discover one that we uh, might have, uh, again, diminished the role of. So with that in mind, I would like to say thank you for your time. And uh, any, oh, wow. <laughs> Good.